Hey guys, so back to one of my favorite themes, uh, prophylaxis. We're gonna start with a pretty simple example uh, from a game that one of my students showed me at some point. So in this position, it's black to move, and we gotta come up with a move for black. Well, I found that people actually struggle to even um, figure out what to focus on even in this position, but I'm gonna give you a clue I mean, always pay attention to your opponent's weaknesses. Um, you know, what can you target? So if you think about that, you'll realize that white has these doubled pawns on the C file. And of course, the one that you can target is the C4 pawn. So the obvious move is bishop a6. And it's already pretty good if you get to that point and you realize like that's a really nice square for my bishop. But it's actually not the best move. And the reason is that you have to think about what your opponent is gonna do when you play your move. So you're threatening, in fact, the move queen a4. A very poisonous attack on the c4 pawn. But white probably is going to anticipate that and is gonna find the move a4 themselves. And then you get kind of stuck. Your queen actually doesn't have any moves. You're not gonna win the c4 pawn. You know, white gets to stabilize. So having looked that far ahead, maybe we should uh, adjust our plans. And if a4 is so important for white as a defensive resource, maybe we should start with a move queen a4, taking that resource away. It's actually a very effective move. They really don't have anything they can do to stop that move next. Right, so really like the way you solve this position, guys, is you have to see your opponent's resources. You have to also like figure out what the right plan is to begin with, right? The right plan is attacking your opponent's weaknesses, but how you do it actually matters, right? So one move allows your opponent to have a defensive resource, and the second way to do it eliminates that defensive resource. And essentially it's all gonna work in the same way. You're gonna win this pawn. They just have no way to really set up a defense to it. So a very nice, simple example of prophylactic thinking, and it's going to net you the juicy C4 pawn. So now let's take a look at, um, not my student's game, but we got Mr. Anish Giri playing against Karthik at the Qatar Masters Open a few weeks ago. And here we're going to have like a much more, well, a more sophisticated example of prophylaxis. Um, we have a pretty unusual position here. Of course, what makes it unusual is that white has extended the pawn in front of the king to g4. So it's a very committal move. White has the bishop hair. But black's position looks very solid. And now most players, I would say, like if you're not at master level or at least expert level, right, you're going to definitely struggle to find white's next move and it's going to require a bit of explanation. Um, you know, you might think about, you know, rook to c1, maybe queen to e2, getting the queen off of the open file and connecting the rooks, right? So those moves could easily come to mind, but they're not the best. And they're not the best because black actually has an idea here that you need to take care of. And the idea is bishop b4. Yeah, it doesn't seem impressive, does it? Um, you might think, well, why is that so strong? I mean, isn't this bishop pretty good where he is? I mean, facing the king? Yeah, he's good where he is, but you have to think about your opponent's advantages. White's advantage in this position is the bishop pair. It's a long-term advantage, and certainly with a lot of white's pawns on light squares, um, you know, the dark squared bishop takes on even larger significance. So black definitely wants to go and force that trade. And white's not going to be able to avoid it, right? Because if they move the bishop there, this bishop will go back. So the opponent wants to neutralize our main advantage. And that's why Anish Giri played this very nice little pawn move, a3. Yeah, not so mysterious anymore, is it? And in fact, he's going to win the game ultimately because he manages to preserve the bishop pair and the bishops do wind up being stronger than the knights. Although... Um, you know, for the moment and for a long portion of this game, black always is going to have some chances because black is solid, right? They're, they're castle. They don't really have pawn structure weaknesses. Their pieces are more or less developed, right? So it's not like, you know, white plays a3 and is, you know, winning by force. It's more like white plays a3, 
stops Black's main idea, maintains the bishop hair, and we're set for like a long game where White tries to prove that the bishop hair advantage means something. I'll show you how the rest of this game went because it's actually quite nice. So both sides brought rooks to the open files. Obviously now you want to get your queen off of the D file. So this is the very natural square. Bishop D6. Okay, so when you see this move, you kind of ask yourself, okay, so why are they moving their bishop? I think they want to come in with the bishop there, settle on that kind of weak square in white's position, kick away the rook. And that forced white's hand and white decided, you know what, I'm not going to let you do it. So I'm going to uh, block your bishop even though it blocks White's own bishop, right? So it's a, it's a bit of a trade-off. We don't really like that pawn in the face of our bishop, but we also really don't like our opponent's bishop going to f4. And one interesting thing about the bishop here that I think a lot of um, you know newer players, even intermediate level players might not understand, is like how their relative power changes in the course of a game. Like one bit, it's very rare that both bishops are like exceptional. I mean, that can happen. You can have two bishops on long diagonals and they're just amazing and that's great. But very often like one will be better than the other and the other has like more of a supportive, supporting role. And, and that can change throughout the course of a game. So like, you know, when E5 happens, I mean, I would say, obviously it hurts the dark squared bishop a bit, right? To have that pawn on a dark square and it makes the light squared bishop a little bit better. Um, but you know, yeah, it's just something you wanna be aware of when you're playing that these things can change. One bishop can become the star for a certain part of the game and then it'll be the other bishop. So if you go back this way, there's a very unpleasant attack on the queen from b4. So the bishop actually went back to c5. And now white you know, realizes that this bishop no longer has a role to play. That's another important rule in chess, guys. Things change on the chessboard every single move. A piece might have been great on a certain square, uh, might have been great there for a lot of moves, but when things change, you have to adjust yourself, right? Like this bishop is no longer great staring into the pawn. So Anish Giri, he immediately moves his bishop to a new diagonal, and now he wants to go bishop g5, which would be really annoying for black. So black moved the queen away. And, well, bishop g5 is probably not such a big deal anymore because now the black bishop can block, so he goes h4. And so he actually starts initiating this play that makes sense given that he has a pawn on g4, he's going to be playing on the king side. Bishop e7, h5. Yeah, you can already see this uh, the outline of an attack if black takes, white takes, and um, the g file will open up. You'll, like, move your king over and start attacking. So... Black played knight f8. The knight is definitely a good guard of the king, um, but it's also a little passive, right? Like, it doesn't really want to be on f8, but um, it's got to protect the king. And Anish pushed the pawn, keeping the knight passively placed on f8. Trade, trade. Black is trying to trade pieces. It makes a lot of sense from, from Black's perspective, but white obviously doesn't want to trade off everything because he's the attacker. So... Not a surprise, the, move rooked, uh, the rook moved away from that trade. Takes, takes, and again, black offers the trade. We repeat, but I think Anish was just trying to gain uh, some moves to get closer to the time control, not actually having any intention to make a draw. Why would he? I mean, he's got the advantage here. So he finally goes rookie one. And this was a pretty critical moment in the game for black. I mean, obviously, black is still solid, but black is passive, and the queen could use some improvement. I mean, this knight is not perfect either. So there were a few different ideas here for black. There was like this a6, queen b5 idea, or maybe just moving the knight to d5. He wound up moving the knight to a4, which is a pretty big mistake, because this knight winds up being like completely irrelevant on that square and just kind of harmful. So Anish goes king g2 with the obvious idea of bringing the rook to the open file. And a6. Yeah, it's a little late for this queen b5 idea because now if you go queen b5, um, I just go, let's say, queen e3, protecting my bishop and avoiding 
avoiding the trade of queens. And then there's going to be lots of ideas like bishop g7, you know, where I just try to clear the square for the queen for checkmate. So, um, you know, having the knight here, yeah, I don't see how that knight is helping black at all. Like it would have been way better somewhere in the center. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just took one really bad move by black to get him in pretty big trouble. And now the attack sort of flows for white. He just needs to bring in his queen, which he methodically does. And then he goes queen h2. I mean, basically black here is on the verge of collapse on the h file. And his only move to keep the game alive was this tricky move g5 giving up the pawn and then putting the queen here to guard the knight. Yeah, it's not really a very obvious defense at all. So not surprising that black didn't find it. He played queen e4, but then the problem is the knight doesn't have a defender. So even though you can win the g4 pawn with check, which looks really nice, but after king f1, you have no more checks. And actually the attack on the h file is breaking through. So in desperation, black played here to try to get the queens off the board, which would be a nice idea, but the problem is there's a bishop hanging in the end, white's up a piece, and you can't even get it back because after rook c3, rook g1 check, king h8, knight d2, white saves the bishop and won the game pretty quickly. Black only has a couple of pawns for the piece, and it's not really enough. So what can we say about this game, guys? I mean... This move a3 that Anish played to preserve the bishop pair, it's definitely in the category of prophylactic moves, doing something to maintain the biggest source of advantage that you have. And obviously it had a very big long-term impact on the game because you know, White's bishops were um, really you know, one of the biggest reasons why he won. Of course, you, know, you can say he won with the attack on the h file. Yeah, ultimately he did. The rook and the queen did the heavy lifting, but the bishops were really instrumental as well, and you know, black's knights were just not nearly as effective. So we do uh, we do use prophylaxis, guys, to uh, to preserve our advantages, and so um, it's important, you know, I think, to appreciate the bishop pair as um, as a serious long term advantage.